From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, out of Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel covers the latest cattle market developments, including comments from Daryl on a steadily improving fed cattle trade and the current trend in premiums being paid for preconditioned calves at the auctions this fall. Then K-State's Monty Vandeveer will talk about how the Risk Management Agency's Pasture, Rangeland, and Forage Insurance Program works. He'll share his analysis of the likely benefits you Kansas producers can expect from this coverage. Later on this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Rudy Benavides will talk about a series of informational webinars available that explore the ways of extending the 4-H program to new youth groups. All this and more right here on agriculture today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre. .ksu.edu. As we take up the cattle markets, typically what we do first thing on a Monday, we'll turn to a livestock economist out of Oklahoma State University, our good friend in Stillwater, Daryl Peel, with his thoughts on these trades. And we can talk of still more improvement, modestly so, in the fed cattle trade this past week, Daryl. We have seen these, uh, you know, cash-fed cattle prices kind of as we expected here after, you know, uh, it took a while to get a bottom in this thing here, uh, and now we're beginning kind of a slow grind higher here, which is uh, uh, mostly a seasonal kind of a thing, but pretty much what we expected. It's not a fast process and probably has some limits on how far it can go, but it's pretty much as expected. That really is the question, the staying power of this, as you call it, slow grind to the upside. You think that it does have its limit? Well, I think so. I mean, you know, again, the the bigger long term picture, of course, is that we're in a you know a bigger supply scenario. Beef production is up on you know whatever sort of seasonal or annual basis you want to look at. But you know, box beef prices are also slowly grinding higher. They're in kind of lockstep with the, the Fed cattle market here. Uh, so I, I do think we'll continue to see again some seasonal strength in these markets through the fourth quarter, and then you know, longer term, obviously, we've got those uh, you know those underlying supply supply challenges that will continue to be there and never very far away. Lend some thoughts, if you would, to the feeder cattle auctions. Again, the volumes can be spotty at this time of the year, depending on the weight class and such, but the tone there still appears to be friendly. Is that your take of it? I, it, certainly, these markets have have remained stronger than expected this fall. Um, I've looked more closely, perhaps, at the Oklahoma auctions, uh, but I think Kansas would be similar. You know, our calf prices, the lightweight end of the the stocker end of things, prices have dropped slightly. If you look from August into mid October, uh, they've dropped about half of what would be normal for this time of the year. So they're staying fairly strong. If you look at the big end of the feeder cattle, they are actually running about eight percent up from August levels. Uh, so we. We've seen very strong uh, demand for these bigger feeder cattle, and when you when you raise uh, the big end relative to the light end, you start to really change that stalker signal in there, uh, offering more value of gain, and that's fairly typical this time of the year, but uh, maybe even a little more pronounced this year. And it really is something of a marvel to watch this market not show any real signs of weakness. Haven't seen that for quite some time. What are your thoughts on, again, how long this market can keep to the upside? Well, you know, it has been a surprise. Again, we know there's bigger feeder supplies out there. In fact, uh, again, I've looked at the auction volume in Oklahoma. Uh, For the past six weeks, we've been running about 11% more feeder cattle in total through the auctions uh, on the combined auctions compared to a year ago. So numbers are up, and yet these prices have stayed strong. You know, on stocker cattle, and and perhaps even more surprising is the fact that our wheat pasture, for all of its early promise uh, in early September, really hasn't developed as fast. Uh, We've continued continued to have challenges with armyworms and other things that have delayed the development of that. 
But I think because there is pretty good forage conditions in general, there's been good stocker demand. I think a lot of stocker cattle are kind of stashed out on pasture now, waiting for that wheat pasture to get there. And as a result, we've continued to see these strong prices, uh, even with bigger numbers this fall. While we're talking calf prices here, your thoughts, we've seen in the recent years, the evolution of premiums being paid for preconditioned calves that go through a rigid vaccination schedule, so forth. And what are you seeing there in regard to the bids paid for those preconditioned animals now? Are they as robust as they once were? Well, you know, we've documented for several years, uh, particularly with our Oklahoma Quality Beef Network uh, program, that you know, premiums are, are pretty persistent. Uh, they do vary somewhat under different conditions. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the things we expect here, again, as we get into bigger cattle numbers, is that everybody that's a buyer in this market, whether it's a feedlot buying uh, bigger feeder cattle or a stocker producer buying uh, lightweight calves, uh, everybody can be a little more choosy and, and really differentiate quality a little bit better. And, and under those conditions, we expect to see more differentiation. And so stocker producers, uh, you know, continue to report uh, plenty of health challenges on these cattle, and and uh, and again, when they have an opportunity to uh, to put the value on these preconditioned calves that reduces that health risk, uh, we see those premiums pretty assured. So it's still worthwhile, although it's not maybe the put it this way the windfall that it might have been in premiums here a few years back. Well, I think it is, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, again, a, a pretty consistent payoff for, for cow-calf producers to precondition these calves. There's a couple things. One, of course, is the, the exact program you go through, whether or not it's a certified, a third-party certified uh, type program, uh, which we we do have data that shows that adds value to these things. One of the things is to think about how you're going to market those cattle, because just because you do things that adds potential value, you really have to make an effort to identify some sale venue that is... Uh, that, increases the odds that, that buyers who value that additional value are going to be there. So whether it's a special sale or or something like that, it's important to do the marketing part as well as the production part of preconditioning these calves. So shop around for your best marketing outlet, whatever that might be for you. There we also have seed stock producers out there readying for or soon to conduct their production sales for the fall and for those cow calf producers looking to invest in herd genetics. Have you any thoughts to pass along about making wise economic decisions given the current cattle market climate in place? Well, I think there's a couple things to keep in mind. One, again, is, the, of course, that we are in a herd expansion still. We know at some point we're going to continue to pressure these uh, these calf prices in the in a general sense. So uh, you need to think about the timing of uh, the next two or three years versus perhaps a longer-term perspective. Obviously, long-term cow-calf producers really need to think about the production value of those cows in terms of the kinds of genetics uh, relative to their uh, production environment and, and that sort of thing. I think one of the things I have heard sort of anecdotally uh, for several months now is, is despite the fact that we're in a broadly speaking a, a declining price scenario here uh, is that bred cattle values have held up fairly well I think and, and there continues to be demand for good quality cattle. So factor that into your decisions whatever you might be thinking about as you go about shopping for genetics yet this fall we haven't spoken to the demand side yet for the product itself what are you hearing on the domestic beef demand front still going decently well I think it is. You know, we look at these uh, retail prices, they've held up very well relative to the other meats, uh, if you look at that part of it. You know, overall, retail prices are holding very close to year-go levels, and again, this is in the face of a, you know, a 4.5% increase in beef production, uh, not quite that much increase in consumption because we're exporting a bit more of that increased production, but nevertheless, when you combine the domestic situation with the uh, continued uh, strength in these in beef export markets, it appears that demand is uh, is quite robust and is holding up very well. Producers, by their very nature, may be thinking, though, when will the other shoe drop on domestic demand? Or, or will it? 
Well, I, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we're still kind of coming out of uh, some very unusual times a couple of years ago. Uh, obviously, there's always dynamics between what the beef industry is doing and, and pork and poultry, uh, and, and they're all kind of growing a little bit, pork and beef especially, beef kind of leading the way. So we, we do sort of uh, kind of hold our breath uh, expecting that there could be some challenges here, and, and yet 2017 uh, has really proven that uh, beef demand can go a long ways to, you know, partially or mostly offset the increased uh, supply pressure we see in the industry. And and at this point in time, there's no real reason to expect that to change going into 2018. That's an encouraging thought to have in mind for producers. We do want to finish off, Daryl, by looking ahead to this Friday's USDA cattle on feed report, what it might indicate to the markets. And last month's report had its share of surprises. What's the general anticipation for this next set of numbers? Well, I think in general we're looking for kind of a continuation of what we've seen. I think there will be significant, you know, placements. We're looking probably for some in increase in placements. Again, we know there's more cattle out there, and that's not really a surprise. But, uh, you know, uh, what what has helped us so much for many months now and continues to is the fact that marketings have also been very strong. Uh, we continue to move these cattle through the feedlots with a faster turnover rate, and that goes a long way. So I, I think it's a continuation of what we've been seeing. You know, obviously there's there's an opportunity for surprises, but the idea that placements are going to be up is not a general surprise. And given the strength we've seen in these feeder cattle markets in the last few weeks, uh, certainly is consistent with the idea that feedlots have continued to aggressively place cattle. So in the meantime, as you look to the trading week ahead, it's likely steady as she goes in as far as fed cattle prices. I really think so. Uh, I think there's some potential, uh, again, over the next few weeks to see these fed cattle prices grind a little bit higher. I don't know that there's a lot of potential to go up a great deal, and it could happen you know, quicker or not, but uh, I certainly steady to uh, perhaps slightly higher prices as we go forward here. It's always a pleasure to get your thoughts and your perspectives on these markets, Daryl, and we hope you have a good week. Thanks for joining us right here this morning. You're very welcome. He is livestock economist Daryl Peel out of Oklahoma State University, and he's among our economists who talk cattle market trends here on Agriculture Today. Now this break, when we come back, we'll take a closer look at what a K-State analysis says about the attributes of that pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance program that you producers might want to consider. That's next here on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Agriculture Today continues now as we've more for you livestock producers who rely heavily on pasture and forage as feedstuffs. There is an insurance program available to you and a deadline upcoming for signing up for 2018 coverage. This was a topic presented, as a matter of fact, at the recent K-State Ag Lenders Conferences this past week by our guest via phone from his office in Garden City. Monty Vandeveer is the research and extension agricultural economist based in southwest Kansas. Now, this Pasture, rangeland, and forage, or PRF insurance, has been around for some time, introduced many years back now, Monty, as a pilot program here in Kansas, right? Uh, Yeah, it started, I think, in uh, 2009 for Kansas, and the first year or two we used a a vegetative index. That was the satellite imagery that looked at how green things were. But since then we switched to uh, a rainfall index where we... Uh, We're guaranteeing a percentage of our normal historic rainfall. And we want to dig into that a little deeper in a moment, but this covers precipitation as apparel only, right? It only insures against low precipitation. All the other things that can affect our, our forage production, those perils aren't covered. 
that rainfall index. Everything's based around that, or a good part of it anyway. How is that determined? How does that identify what a normal rainfall would be for a given producer? Well, the rainfall index, it is just uh, uh, an indication of actual rainfall as a percent of normal. So if you had average rainfall, that's 100% of normal, so your index is 100. If if you had half of normal rainfall, that'd be uh, 50%, so the index is 50. Now, the coverages you can select, you can go as high as 90% of your average normal rainfall, and then the coverage levels go all the way down to 70% of normal. And that rainfall is determined through National Weather Service data, what? Yes, it uses the official government reporting stations, and the way this is set up, the state is divided into grid areas. They're about 17 miles north to south, oh, 13, 14 miles east to west, and what they do is they pick the four closest government reporting stations to the center point of your grid and then do a weighted average of rainfall reported at those sites. So it's kind of a composite measure and the closer the stations are, the bigger a weight they get in that weighted average. So it tries to pinpoint it as well as possible, given the data involved. Yeah, I think having four stations, uh, it makes it a little bit less of a hit-or-miss proposition than, say, just using one station. We all know how it can be raining uh, at your place, and then uh, they're dry as a bone just a few miles down the road. There is another factor involved here as well, as you noted in your presentation, the time intervals, because we know that rainfall is not evenly distributed throughout a calendar year. This accounts for that, correct? That's the idea. Yeah, the policy lets you pick which times of the year you want to ensure your rainfall for. So it has two-month periods, they call them index intervals, and then you have to pick at least two of those two months intervals and then allocate your coverage across them. So you could put 60% in May and June and 40% in July, August, for example. Or you could spread them out uh, all across the year. People use different approaches. As you noted, again, in your presentation, there is a cap as to how large a percent you can put in any of those given two-month intervals or how little you can put in, right? Yeah, you can put as much as 60% of your coverage in, say, one of those intervals. So you could be picking as few as as two intervals. You could go a 60-40, like the example I mentioned. The minimum is 10%. So uh, if you wanted to, you could spread it all out uh, across the whole year. But if you do pick an interval, you have to put at least 10% of your dollar coverage uh, in that time slot. Now, as our listeners can tell, there are quite a few moving parts within all of this. The rainfall index, the uh, time intervals selected, uh, the grid basis that uh, is used here. All of this is captured in a web tool that can help one calculate how this might work for them, correct? Yes, it's available online, and it's just crucial if you're going to take a closer look at this coverage uh, RMA's web page that has all the background information, a fact sheet, the policy documents, some technical details on how these weather stations and indices are calculated, it's, it's on RMA's website. That's rma.usda.gov slash policies slash pasture range forage. And on that page, you can link to this grid locator and decision support tool where you can find your own grid and then look at all these different coverage options we've been talking about. You can experiment those various coverage levels, uh, the rainfall index likely for your area. You can plug all of those numbers in and see where this goes. Then, Yeah, in fact, the tool lets you uh, pick a particular year. Say 2012 was a bad drought year. You uh, can plug in 2012, it'll show the index values for that year, and you can see how your coverage choice would have performed Mm -hmm. in that year or or any other past year you want to uh, take a look at. Under this program as well, one can ensure clearly pastures, rangeland, they can ensure hay ground as well, can they not? That's right. It's not just for grazing lands, it's also for our perennial hay fields, so that's 
going to cover our established alfalfa, our uh, hay meadows. You can use the same coverage. It's all the same uh, grids and index values and, and such. Uh, it, all, it all works the same way. We want to get your thoughts on just how well this uh, coverage can perform for producers from your perspective in just a moment, Monty. But there is a companion product. It is separate, you note. It's for coverage of annual forages. Right. So that would be like your small grains uh, or your forage sorghum, sedan grass, that kind of thing. Uh, Anything that's planted for livestock feed, whether you make silage or make hay or graze it out. You can also get a rainfall. It's the same kind of coverage, rainfall product for those crops now too. Keep that in mind as a second option here for those annual forages one might plant. You have been talking up this insurance coverage with producers, most recently with lenders at the K-State Ag Lenders Conferences. Your take on the overall performance of these for producers and whether or not they're a good option. What have you observed? My general experience with the producers has been there's always the concern about are the uh, weather stations close enough to me to accurately reflect my own experience. So behind that is kind of the question, is this really going to be an effective tool for me? Uh, Most of the sites we've looked at, we find that it's generally going to be a a good option, but you still have that risk that you may not get paid in the event of a low rainfall at your place. And of course, it can work the other way too. You can have plenty of rain, but it doesn't rain at the stations, and so uh, you could get a payment in a good year. But in the long run, almost every grid that I've looked at, if you're in, say, for 20 years, a long time period, then you're going to be getting about $1.50 to $2 back for every dollar that you pay in premium. That's mainly the result of the uh, premium uh, being subsidized, but it's probably going to be a good risk management tool for most of our producers out there. Especially when you think about the irregularities of the weather in recent years where we've had pockets of drought or extended drought in some larger areas, why over time there will be cause for a potential indemnity being paid. Yes, and uh, RMA created this product because, uh, you know, we don't have any other insurance out there for our grazing lands. And so this is probably the best game in town. And for most of the state, I think it would uh, do a fairly decent job at uh, at least providing a little bit of money to buy some replacement feed instead of having to cull some cattle in a bad year. And why this is timely? Among other reasons, there is a deadline for enrolling in pasture, rangeland, and forage coverage for 2018. That's right at a month away, isn't it? Yes, the deadline is November 15th. The policy, the coverage begins on January 1st. So the sales deadline is, you know, backed up a little bit from that. So everybody's got about a month to uh, get on the decision tool, talk to their crop insurance agent, see if this is a, a good fit for them. Once again, do check out that decision-making tool at the RMA website, rma.usda.gov. Monty also has put his PowerPoint on this particular topic online, which lends detail to how this all works likewise, at agmanager.info. Monty, it's a concept which is apparently finding a niche here in the state of Kansas. We appreciate your time. My pleasure, Eric. That analysis of this pasture, rangeland, and forage insurance program from Monty Vandeveer, agricultural economist, K-State Research and Extension, based in southwest Kansas. He spoke on this topic again at the recent Ag Lenders Conferences hosted by K-State Research and Extension this past week. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll return after the break over the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Once more, thanks for listening in. Now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. You crop growers will have access to dicamba to spray on dicamba-tolerant crops in 2018, but the herbicide will come with new label restrictions and will be categorized as a restricted-use pesticide. The EPA announced on Friday that the dicamba registrants voluntarily agreed to registration and labeling changes, including making the product's restricted use, record-keeping requirements, and certain additional spray drift mitigation measures. These label changes will apply to Monsanto's Extendamax herbicide, BASF's Ingenia herbicide, and DuPont Pioneer's Fexapan. State pesticide regulators and agencies will be required to train all applicators before they can use the dicamba herbicides. Applications will be limited to from sunrise to sunset, effectively banning nighttime spraying when temperature inversions are most likely to occur. Applications are also limited to wind speeds of 3 to 10 miles per hour, and applicators must keep records showing they have surveyed the surrounding area for susceptible and sensitive crops. The new labels include graphics to help explain the herbicide's buffer requirements and attempt to clarify what counts as a susceptible or sensitive crop. Now, these label changes do not address the issue of dicamba volatility. The new dicamba herbicides are designed to be significantly less volatile than the older formulations. However, scientists from a number of universities have presented data to show that the products do volatilize and remain in the air for many hours and even days following application. The vice president for global affairs for Monsanto, Scott Partridge, told DTN that as long as its Extendamax is applied according to the new labels, any volatility that may occur would not cause economic damage to neighboring non-dicamba tolerant soybean fields. How dicamba use plays out in 2018 will be key to the future of the new dicamba herbicides, the EPA notes in its release of these new restrictions. Some states are considering even tougher application restrictions ahead of the 2018 growing season. BASF has made it no secret that it was shopping for acquisitions this past year, but the announcement on Friday that it will spend $7 billion to buy part of Bayer's agricultural products business thrusts the Germany-based company onto all new turf. With that acquisition, BASF would become a seed company for the first time. The deal on the table has BASF purchasing major portions of Bayer's cotton, canola, and soybean seed businesses. Also included in the deal is Bayer's non-selective glyphosinate ammonium business sold under the trade name Liberty and the Liberty Link Trait Portfolio, which allows crops to tolerate applications of Liberty herbicide. Syngenta, with their NK and Golden Harvest seed lineup, had been rumored to be a front runner of the Liberty Link portfolio as Bayer looked to uh, spin off its assets to suffi- uh, satisfy regulators and solidify its purchase of Monsanto. However, BASF had begun to stand alone in the field as agrochemical companies have increasingly aligned themselves with seed. This new announcement of the sale to BASF would include nearly all of the company's field crop seeds businesses as well as respective research and development capabilities. This transaction includes the transfer of relevant intellectual property and facilities as well as more than 1,800 employees primarily in the U.S., Germany, Brazil, Canada, and Belgium. This transaction is still subject to regulatory approvals, as well as the successful closing of Bayer's acquisition of Monsanto. And a coalition of more than 100 groups wrote House Agriculture Committee leaders to urge them to reauthorize and fund the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. The National Coalition for Food and Agricultural Research says that that foundation, which was created by the 2014 Farm Bill, has been instrumental in coordinating and funding research on important agricultural questions. The foundation has leveraged more than $200 million it was allocated by Congress in the 2014. 
2014 Farm Bill to fund more than $400 million in grants, the coalition says, noting that the group deserves funding in the next Farm Bill. Some sources report a possible decline to $100 million in foundation funding in the new Omnibus Farm Bill, with some sources saying that amount could be as much as $150 million, still down from the prior level. The foundation matches every one of its public dollars with non-federal funding, meaning it delivers huge value to taxpayers. As that letter read, the foundation's efforts complement the research that the USDA conducts to promote the long-term competitiveness of U.S. agricultural producers. It continued, it went on to say the need for advanced solutions remains imperative if we're to continue to lead the world in food and agricultural innovation. And Canada and Mexico will work toward a NAFTA 2.0 agreement that's fair and beneficial to all. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that in Mexico City. In remarks alongside Mexico President Enrique Peña Nieto, Trudeau said his country would continue to engage in a thoughtful way in the talks and that Canada is committed to the negotiations. Trudeau revealed that Canada will counter the U.S. proposal on a NAFTA sunset clause. This is Agriculture Today. Now, this week's edition of Tree Tales with K-State Forester, Charlie Barden. Charlie? Today, I will provide some tips on buying firewood to get the maximum heat value for your money and effort. Oak is the most common premium fuel wood, but did you know that a pound of cottonwood has just as much heat value as a pound of oak? This is because the heating value of wood depends on the density of that wood. Firewood is not sold by weight usually, but by cord volume. The cord of oak will weigh more than twice as much as a cord of cottonwood. Thus, that cord of oak will have over twice the heat value of that cord of cottonwood. A full cord measurement is equivalent to a well-stacked pile of wood, which measures 128 cubic feet, usually stacked 4 feet high, 8 feet long, and 4 feet deep. An average-sized home heated only with wood may use 4 or 5 cords per winter. Often, firewood is sold by the pickup load, but that can be difficult to know how much you are getting. A standard half-ton pickup cannot hold a full cord of wood because it cannot be stacked four feet high, not to mention the fact that the cord of wood will weigh well over two tons. The best way to determine if you received an honest cord of wood is to stack it yourself. The pile should be 128 cubic feet, measuring the length by the width by the height. Mixed hardwood is another term often used, which can mean different things. If the mixed hardwood cord contains mostly locust, hackberry, and ash, there is plenty of heat value there. If the mixed hardwood is mostly elm, silver maple, or cottonwood, it may not be a bargain unless it costs only half as much as that cord of oak. Also realize that some other woods can have just as much heat value as oak, such as black and honey locust, while a few species even have more heat value than oak. For example, hedge and hickory are denser than oak and thus carry more BTUs. You've been listening to Tree Tales on Charles Barden, Forest of K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Charlie, and we'll be back with more here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Next up on This Agriculture Today, our weekly segment on the Kansas 4-H program, and we will talk more about activities going on under the banner of the New Youth Audiences Initiative with Kansas 4-H. The program manager for New Youth Audiences with the 4-H staff at K-State is with us, Rudy Benavides. Rudy, you are on the fast track with several things going on within this program right now, and we wanted to highlight a couple of them in our brief time today. One, you say, that's uh, been launched in southwest Kansas in a specific county on the basis of what's called a Youth Futures Grant. Outline what that is about, if you would. Sure, Eric. Thank you for having me. I want to talk about the 4 h Youth Futures Grant uh, going on in Seward County. And with the help of Vicki Yorio, the 4-H program assistant there, as well as our Youth Future Site Coordinator, and Kylie Harrison, the Ag and 4-H agent in Seward County, as well as Diane Mack, um, as you know, our Northeast Area 4-H specialist. So we have kind of been there on the ground reconnecting our Spanish-speaking families and the youth in the county 
who are part of this college and career readiness program. Um, with the help of Vicki, like I said, our on-site coordinator, we've been able to sort of foster a mentor-mentee relationship with our participants. So mentees are able to learn more about potential careers as well as college opportunities. So we have actually tapped into the many businesses and educational institutions in Seward County in hopes of exposing the youth to um, a variety of career fields. Is this facilitated by a series of meetings with that youth audience? What? Yeah, correct. So um, basically we'll leave it up to the mentors. Um, we have sort of paired mentors and mentees with the help of Vicki, um, and they meet on a weekly or biweekly basis. They're sort of told to meet, um, you know, up to four hours a month to just sort of uh, tour businesses or go and meet with people in career fields that they're interested in. Um, and then we come in as sort of providing support and any capacity that they might need, um, as well as support for their families. So in that it is based on career orientation, exploring possibilities there, is this for the older set of youth? What age group are you working with here? Um, right now we have uh, primarily middle schoolers, so we're working with 7th and 8th graders, and we do have a few high schoolers right now who transitioned in this last uh, year. So we have about, I think, 9 or 10 high schoolers currently in the program, but the majority of them are middle schoolers. So we're hitting them at at the right age when they're sort of thinking about, you know, their future careers um, as well as college opportunities. This sort of career activity has been going on the last couple of years or so through Kansas 4-H. There have been successes to date, have there not? Yeah, for sure. And we've had great success with the, the, especially the mentors and mentees, you know, they've been able to bond and have a relationship outside of this program. They stay in touch. And, you know, especially during the summer, we had a little challenge because a lot of them, um, you know, disconnected because of the school. (laughs) You know, they they left school and they didn't have much of a connection. But the mentors did a great job of of still staying connected, even if it was a simple text message every day to say, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been really happy with with the program thus far. So right now, this particular undertaking we're talking about today is centered in one particular county, Seward County. Is the long-range hope to extend this kind of opportunity to other places around the state then? We certainly hope so. Um, With this grant right now, you know, it obviously has an end date, and we're sort of um, trying to see what we can do beyond that and see if we can tap into more grant help um, for further use for other counties, for sure. In the moment right now, not sure what our options are, but I know that we're definitely going to want to continue doing this and, and to explore other options in other counties. But it is an exciting idea, it sounds, Rudy. Very much. I'm very excited to be a part of it. Yeah. That, again, is the Youth Futures Grant that's been bestowed upon uh, the Seward County volunteers and uh, extension specialists in that county to reach out to, in this case, the Hispanic youth down in that county, extending them the chance to learn more about career opportunities that might might be ahead for them. The other thing, Rudy, that we wanted to highlight today, you and your colleagues have put together a series of recorded webinars for all audiences, that would include extension agents, 4-H volunteers, and so forth, to learn more about the new youth audiences outreach programs in total, right? Correct. Yeah, we actually have a, they're called Cultural Adaptation Navigator Webinars, and you can find them on our website at kansas4h.org. And they are a great opportunity if you are interested in working or learning about different cultural communities. We started recording them starting back in February, and um, we have a few already recorded and available online. And we hosted a variety of presenters and guest speakers and experts on these different cultural communities. They're about an hour and a half long each, and um, they're a great way to hear conversations and hear dialogue and and, um, any answers to questions you might have surrounding the different topics. There's sort of a a snapshot, I guess you could say, to the different cultural communities that we may work with in our counties and our districts. So they're really geared towards volunteers, agents, um, anyone who's interested in learning more about these cultural communities. So just to give you a few examples, we Mm -hmm. have a few on examining fundamental beliefs, Autism Toolkit, Culture of Poverty, just to name a few. Um, There's definitely a a bunch more on there. Mm -hmm. And these are very handy. Folks can simply go online and uh, download these webinars for viewing and learning at their discretion? Correct. Yeah, they are um, available whenever you want. They've been up there, like I said, starting in February. You can find them uh, available. You don't even have to download them. You can just view them right on the browser. But those would be found at the Kansas 4-H website then? 
Correct. Yes, you can find them on the uh, Kansas4H.org in the 4-H Youth Development tab and the Reaching New Audiences section. It's uh, Kansas4H.org. But once more, the hope here is to include more folks out there that support 4-H in various ways. It could be just uh, individuals that do have an, an appreciation for 4-H. They can be part of this as well, right? Yes, anybody who is interested in in and outside of 4-H, anybody who has outreach efforts, anyone who is a volunteer in a volunteer capacity or role, anybody who wants to just learn for general knowledge about the different cultural groups, you are pretty much going to find whatever you need on this this webinar section. Excellent. And do check that out at kansas4h.org. They put together this series of educational webinars online to learn more about the new youth audiences out there around which the program that Rudy manages revolves. And you have a lot of things on your plate, Rudy, so keep up with Mm -hmm. it all and uh, good work in this area. Thank you for updating us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eric. She's Rudy Benavides, and she is the program manager for new youth audiences with the 4-H program at Kansas State University. And she's been featured on this week's 4-H segment, which we bring you every Monday right here. That is our time for today. We do appreciate you being along with us. We'll be back here this same time tomorrow. Hope you will as well. Until then, Eric Atkinson here, bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.